I think that what I'm going to say today, tonight, it has a lot of uh, resonance of what we've been discussing. Obviously, this is Buddhist ethics, right? We discuss all kinds of possibilities about Buddhist ethics uh, since yesterday. Now, as you see in my title, I have really very basic, but the broad question of what is ethics for? Uh, this morning, Rong Dao asked, uh, who is Buddhist ethics for, right? And now it's bigger, what is ethics for? And then I have my subtitle is really going down to the bottom, right? The minimalist approach to ethics. So um, this really uh, title reflects uh, my kind of struggle that I have recently with ethics. So uh, recently I had a conversation with my colleague in business school who teaches international business. And she told me that, Okay, she told me that she had a conversation with her colleague who also teaches international business. And then they said that she doesn't know how to teach international business to her students at this point because things are changing so quickly. Everything before everything was outsourced. Now everything is supposed to come to the United States, right? All the outsourcing should stop. This kind of rapid change in international trade really make it difficult for her to teach international business to her students. And I immediately responded, well, I feel the same way. I don't know how to teach ethics to my students. There are so many different ideas, so many different kind of positions, polarizations, and things are changing so rapidly. Well, how should I teach ethics to my students? Do all this kind of uh, what you call normative ethics, do they still work? I don't know, right? So that is a kind of a background of this title, what is ethics for? So that is my question. What is, what is uh, ethics like in our time? And when things are really getting very diverse and not only diverse, but this polarization in ideas and then uh, social positions, those who have, those who do not have, the gap become wider. And what does ethics for? What does ethics do in this kind of situation? So I want you to think about real minimum, minimum thing that, that kind of trigger us to think about what you call ethical imagination. And at the time I was actually also was reading a book by Michael Welser titled uh, Moral Minimalism, uh, Thick and Thin, uh, Moral Argument at Home and Abroad. And this book was published in 1994. He republished it in 2019. And then there was a context that he wrote this book, very, very thin book, actually, thin, thin book, uh, thick and thin. The context was the, uh, the fall of Eastern uh, Europe, 1989, and right immediately after that. So he was asking that after the end of the Cold War, there are all these different kind of possibilities. And how do we maintain certain kind of common ground, what you call the universal, while still kind of protecting diversity? That was his idea. So he is saying that, quote unquote, he, uh, the memory of the universal moment. So he does not want to really give up diversity because that's a reality. But at the same time, he wanted to think about this kind of something that keep us together. There must be something that universal, right? And that was his idea. So he said, quote, the thing is of our own history and culture, including our uh, democratic political culture and a way of talking to people abroad across different cultures about the thin life that we live in common, right? So another quote, there are the makings of a thin and universalist morality inside every thick and particularist morality. So this is the idea about really acknowledging this kind of thinness of reality. My, my expression for this thinness is messiness. Life is messy, right? But within the messiness, he thinks that there must be something that we share together, which provide us such kind of solidarity, which make us really go to this moral moment ethical inspiration. What is it, right? So that is his idea. So he says that, once again, quote, Minimalist make, minimalism makes for a certain limited, though important and heartening solidarity. 
it doesn't make for a full-blooded universal doctrine. It explains how it is that we come together. It warrants our separation. By its very thinness, it justifies us in returning to the thickness that is our own and could. So here you see that this is a real great idea. We do not want to kind of use certain kind of universalist idea, something that kind of a totalizing people. But at the same time, there should be something that was the idea. The idea was attracting, but I didn't feel comfortable with this idea. And it begins like this. The very beginning, at the very beginning of the book, he's talking about this protest in Praha. That was in 1989. There was what is called the Velvet uh, Protest in uh, 2019. They were celebrating the uh, 30th anniversary. They were uh, obviously marching against a kind of communist party, right? Uh, so the, what Michael Walter says in this book at the very beginning is this. Uh, he does not know Czech language. But when he saw this picture, I don't know whether it was exactly this picture or not, this picture, uh, kind of couple of English vocabulary, truth, justice. He said he was able to kind of feel solidarity with these people who are on the street marching. So he said, well, he doesn't even have to know the language, right? The moment he, he saw that the justice and truth, he knew that these people are marching for truth and justice, which deserve kind of such support. So he felt solidarity. And I said, well, that was good old days, 1989. 2022, do we still feel that way? I doubt it, right? So as you see here, in Washington, D.C., where I live, or in Seoul, where I go often, you see that two kind of opposite uh, the claims, people who claim for opposite things, they march together. And they claim for justice, truth, human dignity, human rights. But what they mean by that are almost opposite to each other. So as you see here, there's abortionist marching and then anti-abortionist marching. They are marching together. Both of them think, talk about the truth, justice, and human dignity, and so on and so forth. Now, what do we do with this kind of situation? One might be this thinness that put us together in 2022, not 1989. And it was this kind of uh, thinking that inspired by this uh, Michael Walzer's idea of moral minimalism, but without agreeing him that the, this idea of traditionally could be kind of thinness, uh, the truth of justice and solidarity might not work in our time. So I think that this idea of uh, compromisability of this idea. So more and more, the ideas of justice, truth have become compromisable values in our time. Obviously, we do not want to give up this, this kind of concept, but still we, we've been seeing so many occasions that these concepts have been compromised. So in this context, I'd like to kind of get into a Buddhist idea and think about what might be this, uh, I want to think about Buddhist, uh, uh, idea of this uh, or Buddhist candidate for this uh, thin morality. And I begin to think about really suffering. As we all know, as Buddhist scholar, the Buddha was, or the Buddhist tradition was clear from the very beginning that the goal of Buddhist teaching is to getting rid of suffering, eliminating sort of suffering. And then my question then, what kind of suffering are we talking about in our time? So suffering in the Buddha's time or all the Buddhist texts and suffering in our time might have some differences. So I would like to think about why I think that suffering could be a really the kind of beginning point for Buddhist moral imagination as a thin morality. And so there are different kind of uh, uh, categories of suffering we can think about. Uh, the, by putting Buddhist suffering as a thin morality. The first one is obvious suffering of human beings. And in that case, it is not only just uh, um, the mental kind of a malfunctioning, but in the context of what we, uh, what we call engaged Buddhism, which also have social dimensions, social political dimensions. So Thich Nhat Hanh, 
uh, we've been talking about Ting Nathan a lot. Ting Nathan, in, in one of his interviews uh, titled The History of Engaged Buddhism, he said, quote, Buddhism that uh, engaged Buddhism is, quote, Buddhism that re responds to what is happening the here and the now. And that here, what is happening here and now, obviously, in many cases related to suffering, right? And more, if we go to the Korean tradition, in Korean Buddhism, 1970s and 80s, there is a Buddhist school or Buddhist activism called Minjung Buddhism. What they claimed was that Buddhism is really to get rid of suffering. If Buddhism is really serious about getting rid of suffering, Buddhism should really tackle all these kind of causes of suffering, including especially the political oppression, economic exploitation, social discrimination, as well as mental malfunctioning. So here you see kind of whole package of suffering that we are experiencing in modern world, right? And if you, so that's the 20th century, if you come to the American Buddhism, I really think that American Buddhism is really doing a great job in this context, really connecting this Buddhist idea of suffering with uh, the social issues in American uh, society. So one of the examples that I put here is the, the most uh, the recent publication, Black and Buddhist. This is about the African-American Buddhist practice. They, they use this uh, Buddhist meditation as a way to move forward about uh, uh, challenging the racism. And for them, it is a, this, a, the trauma of racial discrimination is not just a, right now, it's a kind of a generation after generation. They have this trauma embedded in their life. And they think that in order to challenge this uh, racism, Instead of just getting angry at the situation, you should be able to control yourself. And one of the expressions they use is that we sit together so that we can stand up together. So here you see clearly the connection between meditation and then mental control to the social movement. So I see that this kind of suffering of human beings of various kind of the dimensions, once we begin to see this kind of situation, and if we can, um, exercise our moral imagination, then suffering, realization of suffering of other people and oneself can be the starting point for ethical imagination and then that will move to the ethical uh, activism, right? But the suffering is not only about human beings and we, we can also think about suffering of uh, non-human animals. And yesterday we talked about the Buddhist animal ethics. And when you talk about the how humans should treat animals, uh, we ask this question a lot. Can they think, can they talk? As if this kind of uh, capacities uh, can be a ground for human beings not treating them well. Well, I don't know whether they can think. I don't know whether they can speak. They must have their own communication system. They must have their own way of thought system. But, but I think that, the, that those ideas are not actually the measurement of how humans should treat animals. And I'm fully uh, agree with uh, Jeremy Bentham when he said it's, a, it's the 18th century, right? And the later Peter Singer also used this, uh, Reiko also used this uh, passage in your article. So Jeremy Bentham says that, quote, a full grown horse or dog is beyond comparison a more rational as well as a more conversable animal than an infant of a day or a week or even a, a month old, right? So if you really think that whether one, uh, the animals can speak or think, that doesn't work because the human, uh, the infant human beings are perhaps uh, are weaker in that point than animals. So he said, quote, the question is not, can they animals, can they reason? Can they talk, but can they suffer? And obviously we can see that they suffer, then that should be the kind of foundation or starting point for our treatment of animals and animal ethics. And from here, I would like to move even further and think about the suffering of inanimate beings and AI and the machine beings, right? So in Buddhist tradition, obviously there was a kind of a debate about can, uh, the rock, inanimate being, or plant, and their enlightenment. But here we can also think about inanimate beings. So I put the, this kind of a picture of a robot right, and uh, some of you might think, "Are you crazy, right? Robots is claiming for the rights, like a human human rights." But as you know, that we've been talking about animal rights, 
And when you talk about animal rights, that does not mean that animal is going to claim their rights as humans do, or animal is going to sue human beings in claiming their, uh, their rights. But then human beings should act as representatives for animals to make sure that our treatment of them aligns with our sense of human dignity, which should guide the human beings relation with other beings, be they human animals or non-human animals. And I think that the same thing goes to our machine beings or AI. And one might think that this is not right now, right? This is a futurist idea. And I begin to think that that's not the futurist idea. This is not a science fiction anymore. So machines are part of our life. Just to see, we, we just to experience that when this machine stops functioning, we freak out, right? This, uh, this talk cannot move on. You know that how much we freak out when computer breaks down. And recently there has been some kind of movie and also a novel about this uh, AI being. I don't know how many of you watch this, uh, seen this movie after young which is based on short story by Alexander Weiss Weinstein. The, after Yang, Yang is AI helper. This uh, a young couple uh, hired Yang to take care of their girl. And then because uh, uh, Yang is an AI, one day he broke down. And from there, story moves on. I'm not gonna be a spoiler, but to me, what this movie tells us is that really the question, what is human being? Who are we? Instead of, it's not about this futurist idea of AI, but it's about really what, who are we? So it makes us think about ourselves. And there's, so there's another kind of a novel fiction by very well-known Korean writer, Kim Myung ha saying farewell. So this is also about the AI person and all this kind of a human, the, the machinites. And interestingly, at the end of the story, the only humane being is machine because human beings are so much kind of eager to make development, create something faster and things like that. So in other words, this kind of relationship with AI and machine beings, instead of we think about them just a futurist idea, is a kind of moment to reflect upon uh, ourselves. What does it mean to be human being? So what does it mean that the suffering of a machine being? Definitely, if you kind of uh, break this one, throw it out, that is a suffering of machine. In what sense? Because it has an impact on human beings, right? If you throw out the machine, your, your laptop, you are really, really in a bad situation, right? So that is a kind of our relationship with machine. So I, I, I want to think about all these different possibilities of suffering. So I have brought a the issues of animal rights and the robot AI digital ethics to draw our attention to the fact that the world has become more complex than it was when our ethical discourses were mostly based on the European enlightenment thinkers ideas of justice, fairness, and equality. And the current situation of human existence demands we find a different candidate for the lowest common denominator to assess, uh, to assess the wit and a moral minimalist approach. Right. So when Michael Walter talked about moral minimalism, his idea was justice, fairness, or equality, truth. But I, would, I think that, once again, these are, these are becoming more and more compromisable. And we would, I would like to think about something different and that within Buddhist tradition. But at the same time, Buddhist understanding of suffering also needed to be revised as we move on. Once again, the kind of suffering Buddha talked about uh, 2,500 years ago and the suffering that the dimensions of suffering we are experiencing today must be different, not absolutely separate. But then if suffering is the only reality, there's not much, not much hope. And Buddhism gave us hope, which I would say wisdom, right? So if suffering is the reality of human existence, in a way, the arising of suffering, not suffering itself, but then Buddhism also provides this idea of wisdom, possibility of overcoming suffering. So wisdom in Buddhism entails the capacity to understand the reality of existence, which from the Buddhist position means to realize that things do not exist through self-nature, but instead through 
multi-layered causes and conditions and those are empty. We talk a lot about the dependent polarizing emptiness and so on and so forth uh, uh, today. So uh, just to cite the two examples, uh, Jay, just uh, his uh, new book, The Buddhist Ethics, uh, defined a, a wisdom quote, profound direct insight into the nature of reality. Or before the Dale Wright uh, in his book, The Six Perfections, which is about really six perfections, right? He defined wisdom, uh, quote, the capacity to envision and work with the emptiness of all things. So I think they appear, they go together. The Buddhist kind of uh, teaching about suffering in life, but at the same time, wisdom as a capacity to overcome suffering. Now, what is interesting to me, one of the interesting to me in this context is this idea of wisdom and radical equality. That Jay said yesterday, if it's not radical, it's not Buddhism. So here is a radical equality. As you all know that in Mahayana Buddhism, everybody has wisdom. Wisdom is not certain kind of capacity, only some special being has. Everybody, absolutely everybody has the uh, wisdom. Now then, that is a radical equality. I think this is a very interesting and strange idea because the radical equality means that the best version of ourselves and the just a common regular or even the worst version are the same. They have the same capacity, right? In that context, I just uh, cited one passage from Li Tungshan, uh, eighth century Chinese Hawaiian thinker, who is an unorthodox Hawaiian thinker, who talk a lot about this humongous work on the interpretation or commentary on Hawaiian Buddhism. And this passage is one of his core idea. And uh, uh, so here it says, uh, quote, between the mind of the Tathagata, the Buddha, and that of all the sentient beings, there is originally no difference. They are both the one mind and one wisdom. All the Buddhas with the wisdom in the mind of sentient beings attained a correct enlightenment. All sentient beings are confused about the wisdom of all the Buddha and make themselves sentient beings, end quote. So in other words, I mean, Buddha, it's not that Buddha has a Buddha's wisdom. Buddha has sentient beings wisdom, but then they make themselves Buddha. Whereas sentient beings, they do not have sentient beings' wisdom. They have a Buddha's wisdom, but they make themselves as sentient beings. So this is really radical equality, what I call, because these two absolutely opposite versions have the same capacity. Now, what does Buddhism want to say? What did Buddhism want to say by saying this, claim for this radical equality, right? We know that that's a very difficult thing to do, right? So one of the way to interpret this one from my perspective is to really think about the locus of salvific power or what we call soteriology. So if a certain religious or philosophical tradition assumes transcendental being like God or transcendental foundation like metaphysics, then human beings can look up to that power for their salvation. Buddhism does not have that. Obviously, there are Buddha, there are, there are Bodhisattvas, they are helpers, right? So as Buddha said, you are your own lamp. If there is no such a transcendental power who can save human beings from human finite fragility, then the, the, the other option is that encourage human being to make yourself better, save yourself. And I, I believe that the, this idea of wisdom, that everybody has the same wisdom, whether you are the Buddha or sentient being, is, is that kind of, has that function of encouraging people, you should do yourself. So then you can go close to this, uh, the best version of yourself, which could be Buddha, or then you are still struggling, right? But then the point is that the, if both the Buddha and sentient being has wisdom, the point is not that the existence of wisdom itself, it's the activation of wisdom, right? So the self-cultivation is an inevitable part of Buddhist proposal of radical wisdom then, that, right? radical equality. But then we might 
ask again, what is so new about this idea of radical equality? I just use this expression radical, but the idea of everybody's equal has been with us for a long time, right? We always say that everybody's equal. And why Buddhist idea of this equality of Buddha and ascension being should be different? And I would like to think that it is different. There, there are differences between the two. And to get to that discourse, let me introduce you very briefly, a modern Korean thinker named Bak Chi-woo, 1909, 1949. Um, he's a trainee, he's not a Buddhist thinker. His training is totally in the Western tradition, Western philosophy. He is one of the, the first generation of Koreans who got educated uh, the Western philosophy, right? The, in, at the beginning of 20th century. And what Bach kind of does in his writings is really to think about the problem of enlightenment thinking and then the practice of democracy in the Western context. And he is saying that the manipulation of the idea of everybody or all is closely related to the way we think the logic, right? And he is really thinking about the, the logic of identity contradiction and excluded middle, which is really one of the foundation of Western logic. That is based, these ideas are based on individualistic one, the one which is not related to the other. So he says that, I'm quoting, the one-to-one -one of the formal logic is possible only when the one is an abstract concept, but when applied to reality, the one-to-one -one is completely impotent. Now he is kind of explaining this by going to the beginning of this idea of especially idea of equality of all the citizens, which he studied at least the during the Enlightenment uh, period, when the bourgeoisie was challenging the kind of uh, aristocrats, right? And in order to challenge the aristocrats' wealth and the power, the newly emerged bourgeoisie class claimed this, uh, everybody's equal, right? And uh, bourgeoisie is one, and aristocrats one, they are the same, we are the one. The missing piece here is that when the bourgeoisie claims that one equal to one, so everybody's equal, bourgeoisie and aristocrat, we are all equal. Bourgeoisie didn't include those who are at the margin. Factory workers, women, those who do not have, they, they were not part of this course. So when the bourgeoisie challenges this kind of existing power structure, they were creating another power structure and hierarchy. Therefore, this idea of uh, everybody's equal does not work anymore. And, and Bhakti is saying that the problem lies in this kind of individualistic idea, individual identity of one, right? Not the relational one. So even though he is uh, totally based on, he was trained in Western philosophy, after this discourse, he says that, quote, I'm a plural singular. This is very much a Buddhist idea, right? So individual is not just individual, but there are a lot of different kind of elements in it. And this is this was for me very interesting because I don't know whether he, because he grew up in Korea or, or even though his training was totally Western philosophy, his conclusion goes to more like an Asian thought tradition, right? So if we really think about this, then we can, uh, see the uh, differences between the equality of all and then the Buddhist idea of radical equality. So when I talk about the radical equality of Buddhism, this is not the equality of the formal logic of one to one, when this one is individualistic one, but equality based on the capacity to respond to the suffering of all beings, which is called wisdom and the activation of which is compassion, as we know, right? And then everybody possess this wisdom. The point is how to activate it. Just having it doesn't make much difference, right? Even though it could encourage it. Then we can also think about this uh, claim of radical equality in a, a little bit different perspective. 
In other words, earlier I said that the, the idea of radical equality has a function of soteriological, right? By giving this idea that you have the capacity, it constantly encourages people to move beyond the current state. And I think this has a lot, there are several kinds of philosophical paradigm which use this idea. So uh, I, I often tell my students, uh, there are reasons why idealism exists. Idealism is, is idealism, but there are reasons that the why idealism should exist because that is always the goal for us to move toward, right? And I can use, for example, very briefly, Jacques Derrida used this idea. When he talked about the democracy, he says that, uh, he used this expression, democracy to come, right? In other words, the democracy to come for Derrida does not mean that certain democracy, which he eventually realized, democracy is always a democracy to come. Because democracy, as you know, is a government by the people. People are not homogeneous group. And in order to consider all the possibilities of different group in the people, there should be constant revision of ideas and institutions and structures and policy. Therefore, democracy is always democracy to come. And he used this idea also to justice. And he says the justice is a justice to come. And he developed this idea by juxtaposing justice and the law. We usually, uh, tend, we tend to think that justice and law are at the same level, right? We use law to accomplish justice. But what Derrida says is that, well, justice is an our idea to be fair, to be equal, right? To exercise, to execute this idea of justice, we created a law. However, law is made by somebody, some group. Therefore, it always has limitations. So the law will try to kind of exercise justice, but it will always fall short of it. So justice will always be justice to come. We constantly revise the law and things like that. And I think that Buddhist enlightenment and exercise of wisdom can be thought of in this kind of the context. And they write in his book I mentioned earlier, The Sixth Perfection, he used this expression, the thought of enlightenment. So he is asking, so how many people actually obtained enlightenment? We don't know, right? But then the very idea of enlightenment keep make people keep moving forward, practice and trying to accomplish the goal. So here, what I try to do is really to see that what is a kind of ultimate ideal world wisdom, enlightenment, and how we move toward that, that goal. Right? From here, I'd like to think about this cultivation in a more social, public, political domain. We talk a lot about this idea of meditation and uh, uh, the Jay said, uh, the systematic uh, violence Right, which is a social political dimension. One interesting thing for me about this, the Buddhist idea of uh, wisdom and uh, the equality and the cultivation is that if we really think about equality, justice, and the fairness in the Western philosophical tradition, these ideas always belong to social political philosophy. Right? But Western philosophy rarely deal with cultivation. Whereas uh, in Buddhism, this uh, the equality, wisdom, justice, these ideas are talked about in the context of individual's cultivation. And that's an interesting kind of uh, position. Whereas Buddhism rarely explicitly make this uh, kind of ideas into social political philosophy. And JJ mentioned that the Nagarjuna has this idea about there is implicit indication but the Buddhism rarely talk about this radical equality, everybody has wisdom into a social political dimension. And now I think in our time, thinking about uh, Buddhism within our context, we should make this transition more explicitly. And I think that what is called engaged Buddhism is exactly that effort, right? To make a connection between the self-cultivation and its social political dimension.
So I'm using this, uh, as you know, that the very much feminist uh, kind of claim that, that the relationship between the personal and the political. So if we want to make this a very personal, seemingly personal domain of meditation in Buddhism or cultivation, which is the core of Buddhist teaching, into the social political dimension or public domain, how do we make that movement? So one of the way of doing it is that instead of seeing personal and political as two totally separate polarized concept, I would like to put them as a kind of a, a same dimension. When an individual member of a community is understood as a being in a network called a society in which all beings are closely related to one another, one's action inevitably have impacts on others, even though the scale of impacts might differ depending on the uh, position of the individual. So um, I think there are scholarship that which kind of really address these issues. One, one example is Leah Kamerson, who is a scholar of Japanese and cross-cultural philosophy. And uh, her recent book, uh, Cross-Cultural Existentialism, uh, Leah Kamerson really take this position, right? And then she said, quote, meditation is not simply a private experience, but an efficacious practice that conducts a transformative energy into the surrounding world. This is not just our ideal concept, right? As I mentioned before earlier, from the example of African-American uh, Buddhist, we sit together so then we can stand up together. And this kind of connection between the personal and the political is really happening in contemporary Buddhism. Right? And I think that that is also very much important issue to think about the position of self-cultivation in our exercise of democracy. And here I'm kind of uh, quoting from uh, Joseph Chan, who is a professor at the University of Hong Kong. Um, in his book, Confucian Perfectionism, uh, he's, uh, he's doing this in the context of Confucianism, but I think we can borrow these ideas, some of his ideas, and actually think about those ideas in the context of uh, Buddhism, right? He said this, Democracy is possible only when there are virtuous leaders and voters, which would be the case in an ideal world. In the non-ideal world where we live, neither politicians nor voters possess virtue or they possess only limited form of virtue. So he's asking, I'm quoting, when political leaders are not good, Citizens can sanction them through election and other constitutional devices. But if the citizens themselves are not good, elections do not change this, end quote. And those people from the US, we are clearly <laughs> experiencing this situation, right? So if this is the case and the democracy is not functioning because people do not actually play their role and how to change the situation? Where does the change occur? Obviously, we want to think about revolution that happens overnight, but no revolution happens overnight, as we all know, right? So um, in that context, Joseph Chen also talk about this uh, education issue. He's, edu he's asking whether our education, well, he's in Hong Kong, so he's talking about Hong Kong, but then he is also talking about that applies to uh, in, in the West, in the in US or many uh, modern society. Whether our education is creating, is to create good citizen or is it to create, create good human being? And Joseph Chen's idea is that we are trying to make a good citizen. Right. But there is a limitation of creating a new citizen already. Right? There, uh, citizen itself has a boundary. It's a citizen of a nation, nation state, and boundary has a lot of problems. So he is kind of proposing that instead of making a good citizen, we should educate our people to be a good human being and then play a role of a good citizen. And he says, quote, a, human, a humanity based moral education seems more effective than a citizenship based civic education in instilling the virtues that promote the health of a democratic institution and processes, end quote. So, once again, he is kind of working on this uh, uh, comparative studies based on Confucianism. Um, 
so like instilling virtue sounds a little bit strange from Buddhist perspective, but I think the basic idea we can get, right? I'm kind of presenting this idea to think about how Buddhist individuals' cultivation can it in fact have an impact on the social political dimension and our exercise of democracy. I can give an example from Bak Chiu, once again, who is not a Buddhist scholar, but then really shows this kind of, uh, uh, what is called, like a butterfly effect from individuals' uh, uh, cultivation to all the way to social political dimension. So he make a kind of a distinction between the two position or two mode of engagement of the subject with the object. So one is, uh, it's my, my translation, one is called positional relationship and the other is called relational relationship. Obviously it's a mouthful, but then, so the, he gives an example of uh, like this, uh, shabby house. So when one sees a shabby house, first you can see, oh, here's a shabby house, rundown house, doesn't look good. You can stop there. Then this is a positional relationship you have a clear distinction between subject and object. But if you really become engaged with object, then you can ask next question, who lives in that house? Their life must be very difficult. They must live in poverty. There you already began to engage with the object, thinking about their suffering, their difficult time. And Bach says that you can move one step further and ask, what kind of society is this, which it let its people live in this kind of condition? Already you get moved to the social dimension, right? And then he said, you should move one step further and think about how to change the situation. So here one says, if one is really engaged with the suffering of others, the one's simple relationship with, with the object can move to the various uh, different dimensions step by step from social, uh, from personal, social, and the political. So I think this is one way of really think about how our kind of personal experience can get connected with our awareness of systematic violence, which Jay talked about yesterday, right? So, um, with this, I started with a minimalist approach to Buddhist ethics with a focus on suffering, which led us to the issue of a tripartite idea of suffering, wisdom, and compassion, and the, the idea of radical equality. And then from there, I, I, I tried to make a connection to the public and political dimension of suffering and Buddhist cultivation, and that also has to do with the different ethics. So when I presented Bak Chiu, I presented only the, his criticism of Western logic. But if you kind of uh, apply Buddhist logic, then it's clear how Buddhist logic is uh, related to the Buddhist concept of no self or Buddhist worldview. So um, just to kind of uh, borrow from Joseph Chen one more time, he is also making a distinction between moral autonomy and personal autonomy. And in the liberalist, uh, liberalism or liberal democracy, we constantly emphasize the personal autonomy, which means individuals, uh, auto autonomous individual, independence, freedom, and equality. And he is saying that whether the personal autonomy is sufficient in our time to think about democracy, and then he is emphasizing moral autonomy Moral autonomy requires, he says, voluntary endorsement of morality, the kind of values that individuals kind of endorse. And at the same time, I think the second thing is really important, reflective engagement. So constantly reflecting upon the situation and trying to engage it, like uh, the, the example I gave you with the uh, Shebi House uh, mentioned by Bak Chiu, right? Then all the things are related to perhaps what they call the moral imagination, the way that our uh, efforts to find certain kind of a common ground without too totalitarian uh, and too oppressive. Right? Let's skip this. So 
actually, I had a conference with Michael Walter and other people about this moral minimalism, and he was uh, he received a lot of criticism the way that I kind of criticized him just before. So you are talking about uh, minimalism, but then you are also creating certain kind of universalism, right? So what's the difference? And what he said, his response was this, and I think it's a, I, I agree with him. He says, I'm not trying to create minimal morality. I am arguing that it exists. So in other words, this is certain kind of conviction that we, we do share something, right? We cannot, perhaps should not identify too clearly. If we do, we are kind of risking risking of creating certain totalitarian vision, but this kind of belief in having certain common ground, right? Like the idea of enlightenment or idea of justice, idea of democracy, that's what make us move forward to create certain type of solidarity. So just to conclude, ethics is not about winning, but about living together, flourishing of all beings. And I think this is uh, one of the part that I've been really thinking a lot about. When the world becomes more and more polarized, if we can say that I'm the winner, you are the loser, right? I'm right, you are wrong. If we can do that, it's rather easy, right? But I don't think ethics is about that. The ethics is not just about making a judgment about who's right, who's wrong. After all, ethics is to live together, right? Flourishing of all beings. And what do we do with that? So it is not just to criticize those whose ideas are different from ourselves, but how to live together with them. So Buddhist teaching of suffering, combined with wisdom and compassion, can provide a minimalist starting point of Buddhist ethics. Because to suffer means to be at the margin. I mean, suffering is not a pleasant experience. Obviously, you are in a kind of a not pleasant situation because of the structure you are in. And even... In this context, I said that all human beings are at the margin because human beings are all at the margin in the existential spectrum. We are all humanite, finite beings. Then being aware of suffering should and can also be the beginning point of solidarity. If we realize that, that we are all at the margin. That's very difficult. We usually don't get to that point, but and that example, once again, I can take from Black and Buddhist, African-American Buddhist, I'm quoting here, the political blankness also embraced the lives of all people who survive systems of racial violence. My identity as being Black means I'm always on the side of those of us who are targeted by systematic violence, including racism, xenophobia, transphobia, misogyny, ableism, and ageism. A personal slogan of mine is that if you are marginalized, you are black. And I begin to see this expression in different kind of uh, scholars, right? So for example, Ueno Suziko is very well-known uh, contemporary Japanese socialist, uh, sociologist and a philosopher in her book, uh, Nationalism and Gender. She says that if you are at the margin, you're a feminist. So in other words, what I'm uh, trying to address here is that the solidarity of the margin is something that we can really think about. So solidarity of the margin through the recognition of suffering can be a potential paradigm of how the personal can be led to the political. And I'll stop here. Thank you.